Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. We've done some walk and talks and did some ministry updates and I was thinking, you know, it's been a week since we did a Bible study. Who wants to do a Bible study? <laughs> so let's do a Bible study. Turn and get out your King James Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 6.15. Before we get there, I just want to ask the brethren how you guys are doing. In the comment section, you can let me know how you guys are doing, that I'm praying for you. And I pray that, I pray this for everyone. I make it in a lot of comments where that you're staying in the Word of God every day and you're staying in prayer every day and that you're being a light uh, that shines in this dark hour and these last days. And I was talking with the brother in Christ that it just seems like the darker it gets, the brighter we're supposed to shine. But brethren, I know you think I'm thinking, I'm just, you're just so negative. Uh, we need to shine a little bit brighter. We, we should be shining brighter than we are. We're not shining as bright as we should be, brothers and sisters Christ. A lot of brethren are trying to run and hide as this world gets darker and falls apart even more and more. We're supposed to be shining more. We're supposed to be standing for God's word more. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel more. We're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ more, being a living witness, shining with the life that we're living, being a living example for Jesus Christ. Okay? So, I got into watching some debates. Every once in a while I'll do that. And I just, it just started eating at me, watching these debates on abortion. And you had these people that profess to be Christians on both sides of the argument, and yet they can't say, thus saith the Lord, to save their life. Well, let's say the Scriptures. Remember the Bereans, they, when Paul came to them and said, this is Jesus, and what he did, and Jesus is God, and here's all the signs, here's all the prophecies he, for, he did fulfill. He didn't fulfill all of them, but he fulfilled enough prophecy that you could say that's the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he died on the cross, that was prophesied, and was buried and rose again the third day. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What did the Bereans do? They checked the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. When someone says, thus saith the Lord, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go chapter and verse. When we say, thus saith the Lord, this is what's right, this is what pleases God, we back it with Scripture. And what I keep hearing out there is I hear, because we're going to be talking about abortion again, I hear all these different arguments, so we're going to go over some old arguments and, that we did before in the past. We're going to go through them and once again debunk them, because this is our final authority, not mankind. Not the flesh, not this flesh, not the world, not good morals. It's thus saith the Lord. Okay. But I keep hearing all this stuff and it's like, you know, what was it? It's a God, abortion is a God-given right. It's a God-given right. Then it should be easy to prove, chapter and verse. Uh, there was pictures uh, when abortion first got brought in. Uh, there's pictures of people carrying cro women carrying crosses, and people and, got, and they had guys and, and they're carrying their Bibles and they're going around with signs saying "My body, my choice," and abortion is a God-given right, a God-given right. Sometimes, brother, sister, Christ, someone can carry this around. There's a there's false religions that use King James Bibles, uh, Mormons, for example. They'll carry this around, but they don't believe in it. They don't follow it. They don't obey it. All the other books in the Mormon system trump this book. You're to obey the Pearl of Great Price, the Mor Book of Mormon, and they have like four other books that they added to this to do away with this. But you can have someone carry a Bible and they don't believe in it and they're not following it. Now, I have no doubt that day when they were doing that, they probably had a lot of Bible perversions that they were carrying around. They might have had King James Bibles, but they weren't following it because their signs were going to prove, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible say, my body, my choice? Is that what the Bible defends? That abortion is a God-given right? Is that what the Bible defends? When does life begin? What does the Bible say? No, 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 we're going to go off of man and science falsely so-called. But what does the Bible say? That's what we're going to do in this study, okay? So I titled this Pro-Life or Pro-Choice, Where, When Does Life Have Value? Because now they're having some new arguments, okay? 
First it's not life till it comes out of the womb, and then when that gets debunked, well it's technically life, but, but it doesn't have any moral value or intrinsic value until the baby actually comes out and is born. You know, it can think, it can feel when it comes out. It actually has value once it's born, but it has no value when it's in the womb. What does the Bible say? And that's what we're going to go off of today. So, before we get there, remember 1 Corinthians 6.15. Make sure you turn to 1 Corinthians 16. Before we get there, I want to ask some questions. They say, pro-life or pro-choice? You know, I'm like, how about pro-truth? How about pro-truth? John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life, and the life. When I say I'm pro-truth, I'm pro-Jesus. No, 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 it's pro-life or pro-choice. You've got to be one or the other. I'm neither. I'm pro-Jesus. Why? Because he is the life and he is the truth. I want truth. I don't want man's morality, mess mucking up everything. I want absolute truth. I want God's truth. I want Jesus Christ. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now I'm attacking, be honest with you, I'm attacking both sides of the aisle. We're going to be predominantly attacking the pro-choice side. But I'm also kicking the pro-life side because you got a lot of people on pro-life side trying to use good morals to defend their stance when that's no different than the pro-choice side. You have no leg to stand on if you're not saying, thus saith the Lord. Why is it wrong? Because God says it's wrong. That's the proper response. This is the foundation. Well, they don't technically they don't believe in that foundation. I don't care what they believe. I care about absolute truth. And if you profess to be a Christian, then you should be, believe in absolute truth. Now this study is for, the, like I said, I don't get mad at the atheists or the people that reject Jesus Christ. They're just as messed up on the pro-life side as they are the pro-choice side. Okay, because the whole point of them being messed up real quick, going off on a little bit of a tangent, brothers and sisters Christ, is what's the foundation if man's the foundation on the pro-life side, then man can be the foundation on pro-choice side, and there's no difference. One says it's right, or I mean, one says it's wrong, one says it's right. Who's to say who's right and wrong? There's no foundation. We have a foundation. Thus saith the Lord, God says it's wrong. God created everybody. He's the boss. He said it's wrong. See, we have a foundation. And this whole study, I put it together because I got so sick and tired of hearing people say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm pro-choice. I can't see how anybody can actually be a Christian and be pro-choice. Maybe, maybe you're newly saved and God's just now kind of waking you up and opening your eyes. I'll have some grace for that. But anybody that's been shown the truth in the scriptures that, hey, abortion is wrong, and they still stand there going, I'm a Christian, but I'm pro-choice. I don't believe that person's saved. I think they're a fake and they're a fraud. Just, I'm going to treat them like a fake and a fraud, a false convert, and I'm going to preach the gospel to them all over again. Pro-life or pro-choice? What about pro-Jesus? What about who is the truth? Pro-truth. What's the truth? God sets the standards, not mankind. That's the truth. Amen. When we're supposed to say them through thy truth, thy word is truth. This is where we get the truth. Not here. Not out there. Not on good morals. Manly morals. Because they always try to, these so-called professing Christians try to say morals. Because uh, they're trying to reach lost people by acting like lost people and talking like lost people. You'll never reach someone for absolute truth that way. You'll never reach them for the truth. Thus saith the Lord. You need to act like a, 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 a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. You need to talk like a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. You need to talk like someone who's in Christ Jesus. And someone who's in Christ Jesus, they quote God's Word. Why do I believe this? Because God said so. Here's another one. Pro-life or pro-choice. How about pro-taking responsibility for your actions? 
That's the whole point of pro-choice, is so you don't have to take responsibility for your actions. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. It comes back to fearing God. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fearing God. What's the end of wisdom? Keeping His commandments. Taking His word and hiding it in your heart and living it. That's the end of wisdom. What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. I, I quote those Psalms where it talks about fearing the Lord is connected to keeping His commandments. Fearing God is connected to keeping His word. If you fear God and God says, don't do this, you don't do this. If you fear God and God says, do this, then you do this. Because you fear God. It's connected to keeping His word. The fear of the Lord. And even in my own life, when I see that I'm not doing what God says, I realize I'm, I'm not fearing God as much as I should it always comes down to that. If you're not doing what God said, then you're not fearing Him. If you're doing what God said, you're fearing Him. And vice versa, you know. But here it says whether it be good or bad. Why? Because people that are saved and born again, this, this is a whole other study we did together, you still have to answer for this life as a Christian. There's no getting out of it. Oh, I just, I, all my sins are paid for. When it comes to, it's starting to get a little warm. When, it's, when it comes to the ultimate price of sin, going to hell and burning for all eternity, yes, God saved us from that when He gave His only begotten Son. Okay? That whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have life. But there's still physical consequences, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later. There's still physical consequences for sin as we live down here, which is why it says, through the t knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. There's still physical consequences for sin down here. When we get up there to the judgment seat, remember there's the judgment seat of Christ, there's the great right throne judgment. Uh, the body of Christ is going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what this is talking about, whether we'd be good or bad. Our life is a Christian. I believe before we got saved, God wipes the slate clean. And then from that point on that we got saved to the point that we get caught up in life or death, we have to answer to God for the life that we lived as a Christian. Oh, no, no, I got out of all of it. No, you didn't. There's still coming a judgment. We are all going to be judged one day, saved and lost. The difference between the saved and the lost is the saved get to go into heaven, the lost go to hell. Okay, we've been saved from the law of sin and death. Whole nother study. But what happened to taking responsibility for your actions? Because you're going to have to answer to God someday. Everyone does. Saved or lost. Romans 14, let's talk about the lost. Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone has to give them an account of themselves. And you read in Revelation about the great white throne where there's a judgment, and that's why we call it the great white throne judgment, because it's a judgment. Okay. What about taking pro uh, responsibility for your action? Being pro-responsibility. Pro-life or pro-choice? What about pro-truth, pro-Jesus, pro-responsibility? You never hear them say that. Even on the pro-life side, you never hear them really push that. Right? It's all good morals. We believe it's wrong, so therefore it's wrong. No, because then you're no different than the pro-choice side. Well, we believe, we believe it's okay. Pro-life, it's wrong. Pro-choice, it's, it's right. Well, who's right and who's wrong? That fight, I, I, I remember talking with the Lord in prayer, and it's like, Lord, that, that fight will go on until you catch us home. There's no winning that fight. Why? Because... When you make man the foundation, there's no winning it because we will never get along. We will never agree 100%. We can't be the final authority. One man says it's okay. The next man says it's not okay. We're not the final authority. So what is the final authority? This is the only way to end it. And not everybody's going to go this route.
But brothers and sisters of Christ, if anything, this study will help you defend ab uh, that abortion is wrong, but do it through the Scriptures. Not through man's argument, worldly arguments and debating, but through the Scriptures. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'm making this quick video because, reading my notes and reiterating, that there are a lot of professing Christian women and men out there that are claiming to be pro-choice, my body, my choice, and yet, is that what the Holy Scriptures say? They defend abortion, and yet we ask them, what does the Scripture say? There's a lot of fakes and frauds out there in these last days. I understand that. But the whole motivation was it just started, you know, setting a fire in my heart saying, this is wrong. These people are supposed to be trying to represent Christianity, and they're fakes and they're frauds, or they're really newly saved and really messed up. Mm -hmm. So let's get into this. I told you to turn to 1 Corinthians 6.15. That's where we're going to start. We're going to start with the question, my body, my choice. We've talked about it before, but we're going to do it again. Why? The more you go over this, the more you hide it in your heart, the more you're going to live it. When you put this down and it starts gathering dust, the world starts feeling your heart, and you start becoming worldly. Start getting distracted and looking at the world and doing things the world's way, saying things the world's way. I've seen great men of God that start to put this down and turn worldly. And it ruins them. It ruins their ministry. You're, it ruins your walk with the Lord. Why are we going through it again? Oh, you've already had a video on this. Or I could have had a million videos on it. We're doing it again. Let's do it again. 1 Corinthians 6.15. Do you love the Word of God like I do? I know a lot of you do, brother says Christ. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 6.15. Know ye not that your bodies are that your bodies are the members of Christ? Question mark. Remember, this is to the Corinthians. They're very fleshly, and what's the number one sin that they're doing that's a really bad sin? <clears throat> Fornication. Okay. What is abortion about? So you can be free to fornicate all you want. When you use abortion as a contraceptive, so you don't have to deal with having a child after a child is already conceived, it's still used as a contraceptive after the child is conceived. 99%, I think they said that around 98 to 99% of all abortion is simply because the woman doesn't want the child. There's nothing wrong with the child, health-wise, physically-wise. There's nothing wrong with the woman. So 99% of abortions are based off of, I don't want the child. I changed my mind. Or, I, I never wanted a child, I just wanted to fornicate. That's what's going on here in Corinthians. These people that supposedly are saved, and I always keep bringing this up, when you get to 1 Corinthians 15, where we get the, a good definition of what the gospel is today, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, how he died, was buried, and rose again the third day. Notice it's being preached to saved sinners, professing, I'm sorry, professing saved sinners, not the lost world. Paul's not writing that to the lost world. He's writing that to the Corinthians who have a profession of faith because he doubts their salvation. That's how wicked the sin is of fornication. That's how fleshly this group of people were that he came through, preached the gospel. A lot of them, some got saved, some had a profession of faith. And once he left, the wolves in sheep's clothing came in and started messing everyone up and getting everyone to be so fleshly and worldly. Remember that. That's where we're in, Corinthians. Know ye not that your bodies are, me are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh? It used to be that when you fornicated with somebody, they, the, the, the family and, and the people in the area would would pressure you to marry that person. In the Old Testament, it says you're to marry the person. If the person was not betrothed to somebody, she's, she's a, um, a virgin, she's not betrothed to nobody, and you lie with her, you're to marry her. Because you became one flesh. Okay. That was pushed. But today, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about uh, abortion and everything. Is it, What it's mainly doing is it's destroying marriage the sanctity of marriage, and it's destroying people's desire 
to have kids. And the responsibility that sex is for having kids, is for procreation. It's for the confines of marriage and for procreation. And it's destroying that. Say, he shall be one flesh, verse 17. And in the Old Testament, if it was committing adultery, or you fornicated with someone who was a, a, um, betrothed, we did a whole study on this. Betrothal is the same thing as being married. Today, when they try to use the word engaged, when you get engaged, according to the scriptures, you're as good as married. Engagement isn't something that you can take lightly and just get engaged and then break it off. And then get engaged with this guy and break it off. And then get engaged with that guy and break it off. It doesn't work that way. That's how wicked, fleshly wicked and vile this world has become when it comes to the sanctity of marriage. Verse 17, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Remember, we're called the bride of Christ. You say, why is fornication that seriously? Because God likens the bride of uh, the body of Christ, saved sinners, to, to, to marriage. We are married in to the we're the bride of Christ. Spiritually, one spirit. The Lord is one spirit. Verse 18: flee fornication. Flee it. Don't make contraceptives to make it easier to fornicate and make you think you're getting away with it. Don't do abortions where you can continue fornicating and thinking you can get away with it. And like we talked about, everyone has to answer to God. They're not getting away with it. They think they are. They think they are, but they're not getting away with it. They're going to have to answer to God someday. But the deception is, is down here, they're trying to get out of the responsibilities and consequences of their actions down here. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And we said this before, what is made, uh, abortion mainly for? To take away the responsibility and commitment that comes with having sex. It's supposed to be done within the confines of marriage. Knowing a woman, the woman knowing the man, it's about supposed to be in the confines of marriage and having children within that confines of, having, of marriage. It's, also, it's just about justifying fornication. And that's what we're hearing about right here. But let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 6.19 What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? No, 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 no. My body, my choice. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. But my body, my choice. Is that something an actual Christian is supposed to be saying or should be saying? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. Brothers and Christ, it's not my I'm a man, so even if we weren't talking about abortion, it's still not my body, my choice. My choice was made at Calvary. My choice was made when I asked God to save me. I came to Him in a repentant state, having godly sorrow in my heart for sinning against Him, falling on my knees before the cross, Calvary, throwing my iniquities at the foot of the cross. When I mean by throwing it, saying, hey, these sins are wicked. I hate them. I don't want them. I can't get rid of them on my own. I can't clean up my life on my own. I can't make it on my own. There's nothing I can do to merit salvation. Lord, I am so sorry for the, my condition. I'm so sorry for my sins. That's true biblical repentance. I threw it at the foot of the cross. What I mean by throwing your iniquities, the Bible says throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross. Okay. Believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that Jesus Christ is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. It's God's blood that was shed on the cross. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He died, was crucified, he bled. That blood was for me because of my sins. He was buried and rose again the third day, proved that he is God, fully and completely. I confess both in prayer, showing I'm not ashamed that it's coming from here. It's not head knowledge, it's coming from here. I'm not ashamed, for whosoever shall call, I mean, 
With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then we get to the last part. I, I was on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't deserve it. I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, but I deserve to go to hell, Lord. Please save me. I'm not worth it. What you did on the cross, I don't deserve it. But Lord, if you can find it in, in your heart, please, Lord, save me. That's where I made my choice. And once I made that choice, it's no longer my body. I now belong to Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about I'm in Him and He is in me. You give me the Holy Spirit and I am in Christ Jesus. I belong to Him. I do things His way. And when I fail, I need to repent, forsake, and let God pick me back up and get me going again so I'm living His way and doing things His way. My body, my choice. No, nope. the choice was at Calvary. Now I belong to God. If you truly got saved and born again at Calvary, now you belong to Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be doing things His way. What saith the Scriptures? What does God say? God doesn't say your body, your choice. But you have these people professing to be Christians that will jump up and down. My body, my choice. I don't believe they're saved. I believe they've got the head knowledge. Remember the knowledge People can fake faith for a while because the Bible says faith unfeigned. In other words, there's faith out there that's faked. What is that? They just have the knowledge. And the Bible talks about that number, that they have the knowledge. They don't have the faith, the real faith. They have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They know what He did on the cross. And they're playing religion. They're using it as uh, insurance policy. Just in case there is a heaven and a hell, you know, I just I have the knowledge of Jesus Christ and just said I believe. Do they really believe? Is their life belong to Jesus Christ? Does their life show it? Where's the evidence? These people, my body, my choice, it's so easily debunkable if you're truly saved and born again and a Bible believer. The Bible teaches it's not your body, your choice. Now I ultimately believe everything down here belongs to God. He created all things. All things belong to God. But when it comes to someone who professes to be a Christian in Christ, what does Christian mean? In Christ. You're after Christ. You're in Christ. You're a representative of Jesus Christ. When someone claims to be a Christian, now they're a representative of Jesus Christ. And what it means to be in Christ, are they living it? That you definitely belong, supposed to belong to Jesus Christ. You're supposed to definitely belong to God. Does it show? Are you still your own? These people that keep jumping up and down, my body, my choice, they're saying, I'm still my own. I'm not bought with a price. I am my own. Remember what Paul said? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. No, 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 Paul, you got it wrong. I'm still my own. I'm not bought with a price. No man tells me what to do. Feminism comes into a big, comes in big time with abortion. No man tells me what to do. Even if it's the man, Christ Jesus. No man tells me what to do. So that was easily debunkable. I wanted to do that again. Brother says, Christ, please, don't fall for this. My body, my choice. This isn't my body. If you're truly saved and born again, it's not your body. It's a temple for the Holy Ghost. And that temple belongs to Jesus Christ. You are supposed to belong to Jesus Christ. Are you doing things His way? Next one. Okay. The women, uh, turn to Genesis 16.11. Turn to Genesis 16.11. Genesis 16.11. They'll say, well, life doesn't begin until you're born. And it's not a child that's in you, it's a thing. It's just a clump of cells and everything. And this is easily debunked. I'm talking about, like I said, this video, I'm directing it mainly at people out there that have a profession of faith, but they're not walking in that faith. Something's wrong. I'm trying to be graceful here. Something's wrong. Either they're newly saved and they're misguided and being deceived, or they're false, fake 
false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, snakes slithering in where they don't belong. I'm one of you. I'm one of you. No, you're not. Genesis 16, 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Remember what he said there, and said, Behold, thou art with child. This is the first time you see with child. And that comes before bearing a son. That comes before the child actually comes out of the womb. It's in the womb and it's called a child. The Bible calls it a child, which means God calls it a child. Are you smarter than God? I know the atheists, well, you don't believe what you believe. I'm not directing this at the atheists. They need to get saved and born again. I'm not directing this at lost people that desperately need to get saved and born again. They're on their way to hell. I'm directing this at people who profess to be Christians. Are you smarter than God? God says that that's a child in the womb. Turn to Genesis 4.1. First time the word conceived is used. Go all the way back to Genesis 4. You say, well, how could that be the first time? Well, with child. But the word conceived, you go back to 4.1, the first time a child is born. Conceived and born. Genesis 4.1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. So she conceived Cain, and then she bare Cain. That's how you read this in English. And said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. So she conceived Cain in the womb. The moment that conception happened, that's Cain. Then she bare Cain. You have people say, well, no, no, that's just conception. And the, the bearing Cain, that's when he becomes a, a, a living person, a living person. Okay, it's not really living until they're born. Okay, well, I don't. That's not what that's saying, but it's still easily debunkable. Okay, turn to Second Samuel eleven. This totally debunks it. Second Samuel eleven. Second Samuel eleven. This is King David with Bathsheba. He committed adultery. He tried to hide it. 2 Samuel 11. I'm in first still. 2 <laughs> <Second> Samuel 11. <laughs> Not 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. 11.5. Now this is Bathsheba. Well, let's go back to 4. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. There's supposed to be consequences. But today we've got contraceptives, we've got abortion, we've got everything we can to try to hide and do away with those consequences. They didn't have that, 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 the sinful, wicked stuff they have today back then the contraceptives and everything. If you, if you strayed, there was consequences. King David strayed, there was consequences. Verse 5, And the woman conceived, there's the word conceived, and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Right there you got both in the same sentence. She conceived and she's with child. When a person, a woman, conceives, it takes two, it takes a man and a woman, not a man and a man, not sodomy, not a woman and a woman, but a man and a woman, it takes two, and then a child is conceived. And once that child is conceived, it is with child. It is life at conception. Period. Why? Because God says so. That's a Bible-believing Christian. Another thing that's been really bugging me, brothers and Christ, is I'm listening to some of these debating people, and they'll say, well, I'm a Bible believer. But they won't dare say, thus saith the Lord. 
They keep saying man's, this is just good morals, and this is just morally acceptable, and, and they try to argue it the lost world's way. But they'll turn around and say, I'm a Bible believer. They're liars. They're deceivers. Right? A Bible believer goes, thus saith the Lord. That's the best verse ever right there, brother, says Christ, that uses conceived and with child in the same sentence. Talking about the same living be, uh, person inside the womb. Well, with child means, you know, that it's going to be a child someday. It doesn't mean it's a child at conception. Right here. She conceived, conception, and it's called with child. It hasn't come out. You can't get away from that. So what do they do? They start whining and complaining. Well, yeah, technically, technically it's alive. You know, it's alive, but it doesn't have any moral value or intrinsic value. You know, until it actually comes out. I didn't have any value until I was born. You know, is that what the scriptures say? Remember, brothers and sisters, we're supposed to say, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. I always, I always think about that when they talk about it. Just a little side note. Those people that vehemently defend abortion, it's not life at, at conception. Yes, it is. We've proven it. Oh, well, it's not, it's not morally valued. I'm going to prove it is. And then, well, you know, this, this, this. If they went back, if, if, so, if, let's say an angel of the Lord took them back to when they were born, and you could see Satan whispering in her ear, telling her, you know what, maybe now's not the right time to have a child. Maybe you should abort this child. You can always have a child some other time. Maybe you should abort this child. That person would be screaming at the top of their lungs, don't kill me, don't abort me, don't listen to that, per that evil spirit, that Satan whispering in your ear, don't kill me. Every last one of them. You know what abortion is about? Selfishness. Not selflessness. Selfishness. They've already been born, so they got through. Who cares about anybody else? At least as long as I wasn't aborted, who cares about anybody else? It's selfishness. And that's what you see in a lot of these people that vehemently defend abortion. My body, my choice. It's selfishness. What they need is to be selfless. Thinking of other people other than themselves. Maybe like the child that's in you. Now they're saying that this is the big reason I wanted to do this study, but we're doing all of it again. Is now they're saying that, they're, that it's life, but it's not, it doesn't have moral value until it's born. Moral value. Okay, it can't feel, it can't, you know, it can't think, you know, it's just until it's born. Okay. Exodus 21.22 Exodus 21.22 Let's go there. How does God value the life of a child, remember with child that's conceived in the womb before it's born, how does God value it? Let's look. This was a big one. Exodus 21. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There's a good song out there on all the books of the Old Testament to help you memorize the order of the books. So Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Exodus 21, 22. Okay. This is part of the Levitical laws, the do's and the don'ts, and here if this happens, this is how you deal with it, the consequences, this is, you know, like the rule of law. Okay. Exodus 21, 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, not with child like, oh, the child is there and already born. No, inside her, with child. Not that has a child, with child. The child's been conceived, and the moment it's conceived, it's with child. So the moment it's conceived to the moment it's born, that's what this is talking about. If men strive and hurt a woman, so that with child, so that her fruit depart from her, from her, the body. And yet no mischief follow. You know what no mischief means? It means it was an accident. Okay. He shall surely 
he shall be surely punished. Now, in this day and age, one of the problems we're seeing, in, in, especially in America, but even among Bible-believing Christians, we, we have this big thing about God's love and God's grace and forgiveness and everything, and I'm not mocking that. I'm saying the way they say it, oh, like they're in a trance, and, you know, in, in a different universe. Yes, God has grace. Yes, God has mercy. Yes, God forgives. But they ignore the fact that there's still consequences for your actions down here. And if it's possible to make it right, you need to make it right by somebody. And when all is said and done, if all you can do is say, I'm sorry and it's heartfelt, then yes, by all means, you say you're sorry and it's heartfelt. But there's still consequences for your actions down here. Someone who's truly sorry faces up and owes up to whatever cost of their actions were. I did something stupid. I wronged somebody. I'm sorry. What can I do to make amends? There's the good word. Make amends. What can I do to make amends? I'll never be able to make it 100% right, but I can try to do what I can. Right here, in no mischief follow. It's talking about it's an accident. It's an accident. Accidents do happen, but you still have to owe up to your mistakes and take responsibility. Remember what happened to taking responsibility for your actions? Today, a lot of people just say, well, I said I'm sorry. That's supposed to get me off. That's supposed to take away the responsibility for my actions. No, it isn't. That's the first step to taking responsibility for your actions. I'm sorry. I was wrong. What I did was wrong. Even if it was an accident, it was an accident. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Okay. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Now we talked about this before, but here's the kicker that the Lord showed me when it came to this new argument. Well, it doesn't have any value. It doesn't have any intrinsic value until it's actually born. The child has to be born to have value. They're so desperate to not take responsibility for their actions. And what, and what they don't see is we look from the outside in through the scriptures and say what you really are is you're desperate, A, not to take responsibility for your actions, but you're very desperate to kill, murder, children. That's how desperate you are. It's not really that. Uh, verse 23, what if it's not done accidentally? What if it's done on purpose? And if any mischief follow, if it's done on purpose... Then thou shalt give life for life. What's the value of with child? Conception. Those clump of cells. They come up with all these other names. Pregnant. Uh, fetus. All these other names. What's the value of it? According to God, it is equal in value to a fully grown man or woman. To a person outside the womb, it is equal in value to a person outside the womb as the child with child inside the womb. It's equal in value. Life for life. That woman that goes and gives it, her life is, uh, gets an abortion, her life is forfeit. The doctor that performs the abortion, and like I said, I always say the 99% because the first thing they do is, what about the one percenters? where the mother's life is threatened, like actual physically threatened, not her social life is threatened or her career is threatened, and all that nonsense, that's like selfishness. I'm talking about the physical life of the mother or the physical life of the child. There's actually complications. There's problems. That's like 1% of all abortions. 99% of all abortions is simply that there's nothing wrong with the child, there's nothing wrong with the mother, and they just don't want them. For whatever reason. Okay. Life for life. The doctor that performs that. Life for life. Anybody that's a part of that mischief that wants that child gone and it's part of that, has a hand in, in making that, killing that child. Life for life. Now, this is Old Testament. Because I know there's sisters of Christ out there that have probably had abortions when they were lost. And when they got saved, they regret it. We'll talk about that, okay? So please bear with me. I'm, not, I'm really hitting those uh, professing Christian women and men that are standing behind these Christian women, these men that are spiritually castrated, 
by these feminist women that are claiming Christianity, this is aimed at them. Okay? According to God, the value of that child, that with child that they call a fetus or a clump of cells, is equal to the value of someone outside the womb. Life for life. You can't get away from that. And they'll say, but no, 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 no. Well, you see, no, what we mean by value, we mean like, you know, that the child, you know, the child can feel, have feelings. You know, they, 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 can, they, can, they, can, they can feel pain and everything, and they can have feelings and everything. And they try to make it out like a child doesn't feel anything. Well, how do you know the child doesn't feel anything? They can't back that up whatsoever. The child can't feel pain. Like when there's a miscarriage, when there's complications, you're saying the child doesn't feel anything? How do you prove, can you prove that? No, they can't. It's science falsely so called. But what does the Bible say? Remember, we're Bible believers. What does the Bible say? Turn to Luke. Let's go to Luke. To the New Testament, uh, the collection of books called the New Testament. This is still technically in the Old Testament, but Luke chapter 1. We're going to be talking about John the Baptist's birth. John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judea. And this is after, I can't remember if it was the angel of the Lord or the archangel Michael or Gabriel, sometimes I get them mixed up, that I talked to her. Okay, I think it's the angel of the Lord, but uh, told her about how she's going to bear a son and he shall you know, take away the sins of the world, the prophecy, and that she would be the vessel. So she uh, and Mary rose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into a city of Judea and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. You have Zacharias is the father of John the Baptist. Elizabeth is the mother. And you can learn the whole story about Zacharias, you know, not believing the Lord, losing his ability to speak. It's a, it's, it's a good story with instruction righteousness that comes down to trust the Lord. Fear God, keep his commandments, but... Lately, trusting the Lord it seems to be a big thing. And the reason I bring that up is when it comes to having a child, you need to trust the Lord. Why? Because God's the one who decides whether a child is conceived or not. Remember those verses we read? He told them, you will conceive, you will conceive. Who controls whether a child is conceived or not? God does. Do you trust God? When, you abort, when someone professes to be a Christian and they board a child... They're saying, I don't trust you, Lord. They're killing that child. They're being selfish. And I don't trust you, Lord. But 41, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is it this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, so as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Let that sink in, brothers. He leapt in the womb for what? Joy. You mean a child in the womb can feel? Absolutely, according to the scriptures. They can feel joy, and if they can feel joy, they can feel pain. Well, they don't really feel any... Once again, they just come up with anything and everything, and they're lying to themselves, and if you lie to yourself enough, you might actually believe that lie. Remember that verse that says deceiving and being deceived? One of the big things to get from that verse is if you keep deceiving long enough, you'll start actually believing, because the person who's deceiving knows it's a lie. I'm telling you, the person that's seeing it, at first, the person that starts the deception and starts lying to people, they know it's a lie. But after a while, they start buying into their own lies. And then after a while, they start to believe their own lies. So they start out knowing it's a lie, but then after a while, they'll, they'll have that whole attitude, I don't believe it's a lie, I believe it's true. Why? Deceiving and being deceived. They wind up deceiving themselves as they're deceiving other people. Okay? They just keep coming up with anything. 
They say when a woman is with child that the child in the womb cannot feel anything and is not sentient. Yet we read a story where the child leapt for joy. Why? Because the child heard the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus, my Lord. It heard it. It can hear. People say, well, it was, it was probably five months in or four months in. It doesn't matter. The child within the womb can feel. No okay. hand. And it's a person. It has a body, soul, and spirit. It is a person the moment it's conceived. You don't have to turn here, but Judges 13.5 says, For lo, we're going to be talking about Samson when he was born. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the birth? No, from the womb. It was a Nazarite from the womb. From the moment that child was conceived, it was a Nazarite unto God. Not when it was uh, born, but at conception, when it was conceived. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. I always point this out big time in my notes. From where? From birth? Question mark? Question mark? At, no! Exclamation point! From the womb! Oh, the child doesn't have any value whatsoever until it's actually born. That's not what the Word of God says. But that's what mankind's morals are telling them. Anything to justify flesh, to justify the flesh, to justify self, self, selfishness, to try to explain away any taken responsibility, Now, real quick, you don't have to turn here, but how does God view harming children? We've talked about this before. Whether when you're with child, at conception as a child, how does God view harming a child, whether it's in the womb or outside the womb? How does God value child? We already told you, we showed you life for life. But if you read Matthew 18.5, Mark 9.42, Luke 17.1, I believe this is for when Jesus was physically present, trying to preach the kingdom of heaven. And this is for the day of the Lord, when he comes back, the time of Jacob's trouble, going into the day of the Lord. Because this is an unpardonable sin, but it's not for today. Today there are, we did that study, go watch it, there are no unpardonable sins today. Anyone can get saved, any sin can get be for, forgiven today. But there's instruction in righteousness here. Like I said, doctrinally, I don't apply this to today because it's not for today. But there's instruction in righteousness. The importance that God places on children. Okay. Now I'm going to read one of them. Let's read Matthew 18.5. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. Like when Jesus is physically there. And when Jesus is in the day of the Lord where it's not about faith as much as it is works. But he's there ruling and reigning with the rod of iron. These little children, they believe in Jesus. And these people are trying to mess him up. It were better for him that a millstone were hung, hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Because God's coming for him. Don't you mess with these children. Today our children are being messed up and indoctrinated through Hollywood movies, TV shows, cartoons, anime, uh, which is cartoons, uh, video games, I think I said, uh, the education system, the schooling system, uh, commercials, sports, music industry, uh, our own government, you know, they're just totally being indoctrinated and they're being messed up and they're being destroyed and it's all aimed at pull, pulling children away from this if they started out with this or preventing children from getting to this. Remember what the Bible says? The parents are supposed to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. They're trying to prevent that. Okay. God values, this is three times in the four gospels, God has a, places a lot of value on children and the innocencies of children and they need to be taught right and raised right. And their life matters. Period. Okay. Now someone asked, I threw this little part in here, someone asked, how does God feel about finding ways to have sex without having children? We talk, I mentioned it, contraceptives. 
Some of these people that profess to be saved and born again, Christians, will sit out there and tell you, well, try to use contraceptives. Abortion is bad. Killing a child is bad. You should be using contraceptives, if anything, if you really don't want a child. They don't tell them, stop fornicating. It's a sin. It's wickedness. They don't tell them that. They tell them, well, you can use contraceptives. What is, how does God feel about contraceptives? What is contraceptives? The act of doing something so you can fornicate without conceiving a child. So I'm bringing it down to, God, to, the, to the basic level because they'll try to use all these different contraceptives and words and technical psychobabble garbage. I'm bringing it down to its simplest form. What's the contraceptives of today? It's so you can fornicate without conceiving a child. How does God feel about that? Turn to Genesis 38. Turn to Genesis 38. That always irritates me, big time. These are professing Christians and they're saying you can use contraceptives. If you really want to fornicate, they don't use the word fornicate. If you really want to have sex outside of marriage or even within marriage, if you still want to have sex without having the consequences of having children, you can use contraceptives and you can roll the dice because contraceptives aren't 100%, but you can roll it. That's not someone who's saved and born again. That's not the talk of a Bible believer, a Christian, an actual Christian man who's in Christ, after Christ. That's a talk of someone who's a fake and a fraud, someone who's worldly. Okay? What does God think about contraceptives, about doing something to prevent conception of a child so you can still fornicate? Genesis 38, 9. Turn to Genesis 38.9. First time God drops a single man dead. One person drops him dead. Genesis 38.9. Getting ahead of myself though. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. Here's the story. You have Judah. If you remember Tamar. Okay. He has a son. Marries her to Tamar. The son is very evil and wicked. God drops him dead. So then the, the way things work is if she, she didn't have a son to keep that seed, to keep that family line going with the first son. The second son is to marry her and bear seed to his brother. And that's where we get here. That's where Onan is. Onan was married to her and now he's supposed to go in unto her and, have, and give seed to her brother. Have, get her to bear children, conceive, bear children, and those children would belong to her brother and be part of her brother's line, family line. The one that died, that God struck down dead. Genesis 38, 9, And Onan knew the seed should not be his, and it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife, if he knew it shouldn't be his, then he shouldn't have had sex with her. But he wanted to have sex with her. But he didn't want to have the child. So what did he do to prevent from conceiving a child? He spilled it on the ground. Lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. And I'm not going to try to get into that too much, but bottom line, anytime you're doing something so you can get that feeling of fornication, and you're not doing it properly in the confines of marriage and with your wife, right, or you're using contraceptives, how does God look at you trying to prevent from having a child. He dropped the man dead. Praise God for His grace today. Because if you know my testimony, you know, my addictions, I'll bring it up again, my addictions that I still struggle with today is Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, porn. People say, are you in porn hardcore? No, I'm not in porn hardcore anymore. God got me clean of it. But anytime I walk around, because I put so many bad images in my head, God's helping me get rid of those images to a point and putting good things in my head, put good things in my heart. But anytime you walk out there and you see and you start seeing some of that garbage, when I see a movie sitting on the stand for sale, or I see that I start thinking of some movies and I've got I have to start seeing some hymns. I've got to start talking to the Lord saying, Thank you, Lord, for getting me out of that garbage. But it's always going to be a struggle. Okay, a lot of us have testimony, especially in these last days. Porn is everywhere. All right. Praise God for His grace and His mercy. I deserve to be dropped dead as a lost man. As a saved man, it's only by God's grace that I'm still standing. Okay. 
Don't let people push you. Well, it's not that big of a deal, even if it's done within the confines of marriage. You're not supposed to be using contraceptives. You're not supposed to be doing anything and everything you can so you can have that feeling of fornication without the consequences of, of conception. You're trying to keep, get out of trying to get a woman. All that contraceptives and abortion, it basically destroyed the sanctity of marriage in America. It really has. It destroyed people's heartfelt desires of having children and how you treat children. How you view children got changed. They don't view children as life. They don't view children as having any value within the womb. We've talked about that. Okay. Now, I won't always go over this with because I might have sisters in Christ that will start feeling bad going through this study because I made that mistake. Or you can have some brothers in Christ that, hey, I was part of, of I know I didn't have a say in it because in America the man doesn't have a say, but I was for it. I know I didn't have a say in it, but when she said she was getting an abortion, I, 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 I felt relieved because now I don't have that pressure or that responsibility, and I was for it. And now that I'm saved and born again, I was so wrong in, in how I felt. I was so wrong for being okay with that and backing it up. Can God forgive you? Remember, we read the Old Testament, how God feels. If we were still under the Old Testament, I'd have been put to death a long time ago. A lot of you probably say, well, I would have been put to death a long time ago if we were under the Old Testament. Praise God, we're under the New Testament. Okay. Can God forgive you? First John whether you're using, like I said, whether you're using contraceptives or you've been a part of abortion, can God forgive you? Now we're going to go to God's grace. And we're going to talk a little bit about real repentance. <clears throat> Turn to 1 John 1 9. We'll turn there. Turn to John, this is important. Turn to 1 John 1 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to take it back to verse 6. Let's take it back to verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That comes back to, are you truly saved and born again? People say, well, you're teaching a workspace. Out. No, I'm teaching what John taught, what Paul taught. If you truly got saved and born again, remember we talked about Corinthians. He started doubting their salvation. If a man be called a brother. If a man be in Christ. Oh, I'm going to have to preach the gospel to you guys all over again, 1 Corinthians 15, to professing saved sinners. There's supposed to be evidence that you're saved and born again. And what, what he's talking about here is you're walking in the light. You're in Christ Jesus our Lord with the life that you're living. And when you have people that are walking in darkness, justifying sin and wickedness, my body, my choice... The baby doesn't have, and they're justifying sin, wickedness, filth, looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie, 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 and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, you can still stumble, you can still trip and fall, brother, sis, Christ. I do. I've made mistakes. I failed the Lord. But I will not stand here, or sit here, I'm sitting here, I will not sit here and defend those mistakes and try to justify them. I will not stand here and justify my sins, present tense, that I've asked for forgiveness, but like when you make a mistake, you still sin, I'm a saved sinner. The sins that I commit today as a saved sinner, I will not sit here and try to justify them. Try to explain them away like it's not a big deal. Sin is still a big deal in my life. I'm, try, I'm not talking about it's big in my life. I'm talking about in my life, sin is still a big deal. I always try to keep sin out. I always try to do what the Lord says. Try to serve the Lord, follow the Lord. But there's times I trip and fall. That's where repent, forsake, and let God pick you back up and get you back going with Him. Get your walk with the Lord going strong again. And anytime you fall, let the Lord pick you back up. Come to Him in repentance. Which we're going to be talking about as we keep going. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The ultimate cost of sin. Hell. 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember the us part, say sinners. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Remember what the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How do we get away? How, how do you overcome sin in your life? This right here. Taking God's word and hiding in your heart. Listening to good preaching. Especially preaching that has a zero tolerance for sin. When you have men that are all about love and, and, and joy and, and God's forgiveness, but they don't preach, they don't have this attitude of zero tolerance for sin. Hey, that's sin, that's wickedness, get it out of your life. You're not doing right by the Lord. You're letting Him down. You're letting the brethren down. You need to get your heart right with the Lord. If you don't have someone that's preaching like that, don't listen to them. Find someone else. Okay? There's good fearing. Some people say, well, some preachers are fear mongers. There's good fearing when they put the fear of God in you. There's bad fear mongers when they're putting the fear of the world in you. Because there's some brethren that have turned to become fear mongers when it comes to the world. They're getting you to fear the world and what's going on in the world. And they're taking away the fear of God. Good preachers will put the fear of God in you. Zero tolerance for sin. But good preachers will always point you to the solution. Jesus Christ. Take it to Him. Confess your faults to me like brothers in Christ. Not me like I'm a priest or something. But you confess your faults one to another. We're supposed to be held accountable one to another. Confess your faults to a brother in Christ in fellowship. Remember it talked about having fellowship one with another. That's what that's for. One of the big parts of fellowship is confessing your faults one to another. Just like I confess my faults. Okay. Uh, I confess my faults where I started feeling lonely, I started getting a depression, and this and that. You confess your faults. Okay. Start to, not the depression's a fault, but my reaction to that depression was not proper. Hiding and just, you know, ignoring brethren and just going into hiding and stuff like that. It's like, that's not the right way to handle it. That's what that fellowship's for, to be held accountable one to another. You confess your faults one to another, but you confess your actual sins to God. And you come to Him broken in true biblical repentance. Uh -huh. uh, Philippians 2.10, you don't have to turn here, but Philippians 2.10 we read, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God, to the glory of God the Father. We've done that now. The lost world will do that in the future. The great white throne judgment. They will be confessing that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. Uh -huh. Verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does it mean by working out your salvation? Get it repented. Get it forsaken. And get back to serving God. Get back to living for Jesus Christ. And I've read that because the hardest thing is much more in my absence. Why is in fellowship and why are we hurt? And why is the body why do I believe the body of Christ is hurting so much in these last days? is we don't have the fellowship that we're supposed to have. The face-to-face -face fellowship where you're holding each other accountable. We're confessing our faults. We're holding each other accountable. We're actually seeing how each other's living to hold them accountable. So everyone, it seems to be like loneliness. Everyone's in absence. We're all spread out. And we're sitting here. There's nobody here. And we tend to forget that God's still here. Remember what, what Paul said? Uh, everyone had forsaken me, but I wasn't alone. Jesus was with me. But sometimes we forget Jesus is here because we start getting physically alone, and we think, well, we're alone, and that's when te the temptation gets the strongest to do what's wrong versus to do what's right. And some of us fail. I failed. Okay. But this is Christ. Whether we're together in fellowship, and I pray for fellowship, and I, I strongly desire fellowship for the brethren. We still need to work hard at, okay, we're alone, but we're not alone, and I still need to live right, and I still need to make right decisions. 
But when you fail, brother, sister Christ, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But that's temporary salvation. That's our life down here as a Christian, not eternal salvation. It's temporary salvation is what it's talking about. Our sa God's saving grace in this life that we're living, because there's still consequences for sin down here. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's for saved and lost. That's just the way sin works, period, when it comes to the flesh. There's consequences for sin. The ultimate consequence, going to hell and burning for all eternity, my Lord and Savior paid for on the cross, and He paid it for you too. But there's still temporary consequences in this life. Get it repented. Get it fixed. If you've ever made the mistake of abortion for this topic, this goes with any sin, but for the topic we're talking about when it comes to abortion, contraceptives, get it repented. Godly sorrow, true shame, true sorrow in your heart. Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. I was wrong for doing it. Please forgive me. Help me not to ever make that mistake again. Lord, I'm getting back to my walking for you. Keep sanctification, keep staying in God's Word, reading God's Word, prayer, praising God, giving Him glory in all things, giving Him thanks in all things. Okay. And we're going to skip this part. I put in here because we talk about a lot how people can be fake when it comes to repentance. We've talked about a lot. Be sincere. You know what sincere means? That it's serious and it's real. You're not just saying it to say it. Because today a lot of people will say what you want them to hear to please you. There's people trying to tell God what He wants to hear, but God looks at the heart. And I had some scriptures to back that up, but God looks at the heart. Are you just telling me what I want to hear? Or are you being sincere? Okay. So brothers and Christ, make sure it's sincere when you're repenting. So this has been going for a while. So, Brothers is Christ, abortion. Okay? My body, my choice. No, it's not your body, your choice. Well, it's not really life at conception. It's only life when the child's born. That's also a lie. We've debunked that. Well, it doesn't have any intrinsic value. Okay? No, it does. It's a life. It has feelings. It can feel. It can think. It could hear Mary speak. Uh, John the Baptist, when he's in the womb, he could hear Mary speak and, and know, and know, that it was the mother of Jesus Christ. And he leapt with joy, feelings. So he had knowledge, he could think, and he had feelings. Mm -hmm. But this is Christ, my main reason for doing this study is because, brethren, we need to stick to the Word of God. The mission doesn't change. No matter how bad the world gets, uh, first, it was trying to fearmonger us with the uh, economy f collapsing. When uh, Trump first got was going to get into office, people were telling me, "Well, he's going to get in there. We're going to, and he's going to help us go through a bankruptcy." Uh, the, and it was fearmongering. Then it was World War III, what's going on in Ukraine. Um, then now there's this civil war. There's there's talk of civil war, and everything. it's all fearmongering, getting you distracted and being fearful of the world. Some of these brethren that are pushing that fear-mongering has forgotten that they can't... There was a brother in Christ that used to preach that they, the enemy, the lost world, cannot do anything to us, brothers and Christ, unless they have God's permission. And you go back to Job, where Satan had to have God's permission before he did anything to Job. Job belonged to God. Satan needed God's permission. I belong to God. Do you belong to God, brothers and Christ? brothers and sisters in Christ, then they need God's permission. Could I die for the Word? Could we go through some hard times? Yes. But that's God's will. Trust the Lord. They can't do nothing to us without God's permission. And the whole point of me pushing that is we need to continue living a life of Christ. We need to continue doing things God's way. We need to keep the focus on fearing God, not the world. We need to keep the focus on looking for that blessed hope, not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Not looking for trouble, but they claim they won't say they're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's like they're trying to get you to prep, prep, prep for the time of Jacob's trouble and hard times and not pre prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How's your heart? How's your life? 
Are you witnessing when the doors open? Are you laying out gospel tracts? Are you reading this book every day? Are you still praying every day? Starting your day with the Word of God, ending your day with the Word of God. Are you still there for your brothers and sisters Christ? Are you showing real love for your brothers and sisters Christ? Or are you falling in the trap of having hate and bitterness and contempt for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Uh oh, I see that out there. The love for the God's Word, the ministry, if you're a man called into ministry, that the ministry is still coming first. Preaching the Word, not the world. Okay? The reason I say this is I want to leave you with two sets of scriptures. Okay? I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but you can turn there. Pause the video and turn. But 1 John 2 1. Brother Christ, doesn't matter how bad it's getting out there, this is still the final authority. This is still the final authority. This is still the solution. If you're going to say that this is wrong, and the main subject of this was abortion, if you're going to say something's wrong, it's sinful, it's wicked, this is the foundation. Why is it wrong? Because God said so. This is still the foundation. This is still how we're supposed to live. This doesn't change no matter how bad the world's getting. And I see a lot of brethren falling away because they're getting distracted by the world and they're not focusing on the Word of God and living the life of Christ. 1 John 2, 1. My, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, because we do sometimes, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means ready to forgive. I remember getting into this with these easy believism. Oh no, he's forgiven all or He's ready to forgive. That's what propitiation means. And remember, this is a directed at, sin, at saved sinners. He's ready to forgive. We still need to take our present tense sins to God in repentance. Repentance starts at salvation and continues the whole life of a Christian. You screw up, you stumble, you fall, you need to come to God broken in, in repentance. Confess those sins. Get your heart right with God and get back to living for Him. He is, and He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world, the whole world. Anybody can come to God and get saved. Anybody can come to God, get saved, born again, and get their sins forgiven. There's your choice. My body might... No, there's your choice. That's the choice you get to make. It's not about choosing my body, my choice... It's about, are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? Remember that magnet on my truck? I still like to talk about it because I love testimonies. If you're going to go to heaven, I would say, if you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? And someone kept saying, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. And I told them, you don't have to go. Yeah, but it's my choice. You're right. That's your choice. That's where your choice is. And people are making the wrong choice. They're choosing hell over heaven. Verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know Him. How do we know Jesus Christ? People always say, I love Jesus Christ. I know Jesus Christ. If we keep His commandments. That's how you know Him. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. If you love me, keep my commandments. You are my friends if, if you do whatsoever I command you. Oh no, I got saved so I didn't have to worry about any of this stuff. That's what this easy believism. Never came to God broken, never repented. They take repentance out of salvation. They don't even ask God to save them. They just head belief. Well, I did that so I wouldn't have to keep God's commandments. I can do whatever I want and He'll just forgive me. No, we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments. Remember? Because people think this is contradiction. It's not. It says, and if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. There's times we're going to stumble and fall. What this is talking about here, where it says, and he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, are those that justify sin. That try to weasel the way out of responsibility, taking responsibility for their actions. That's who this is talking about. And he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. What we read earlier. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected. Remember, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. How is the love of God perfected? In you, brother, sister Christ. 
the changed life, sanctification, your stands for absolute truth in the life that you're living. That's how the love of God is perfected. The world sees the love of God in us when we're living according to His Word. When we're living the life of Christ, they see the love of God perfected in us. That light that I was talking about earlier, we're in a dark, dark world. You think our light would shine brighter? I was talking to my brother in Christ about this. You think it would shine brighter? But it's not. Our light seems to be dim. Why? Because the love of God is not being perfected in us if we're not keeping His Word and living the life of Christ. The life of Christ. Taking God's Word, hiding it in our heart, going through sanctification. Thus saith the Lord, He says it's wrong, it's wrong. If He says we're supposed to be doing this, I need to be doing this. Okay? Everybody know that we are in Him. You know why a lot of people doubt their salvation? Because they're not taking God's Word, hiding it in their heart, and actually living it. Some of them try to grab from other dispensations. They don't follow 2 Timothy 2.15. They try to grab from the Old Testament. And that will never give you that assurance. It's if you abide by the Pauline epistles, which is in the New Testament primarily, not for doctrine, and the instruction of righteousness is all through the Bible, but you're taking God's Word, you're hiding it in your heart, and you're living it. That's how you have a good assurance of salvation, to change life. I'll be honest with you, I've talked to people where they don't feel like there's much of a change in their life, and that's why they start doubting their salvation. There's some brethren that fall away, that try to fall back into the old man. The Bible talks about, Paul got, talks about those people trying to resurrect the old man. What's it do? It gets you down, gets you to start doubting your salvation. How do you come back to being assured of your salvation? But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, Hereby know we, know we, that we are in Him. Luke eleven twenty seven, And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice, and saith unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. The flesh, worldliness. The people say, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. What is Jesus' response? People get distracted by the world. They get distracted by the wrong thing. What does Jesus say? But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Instruction and righteousness throughout the whole Bible, from Adam and Eve all the way to the new heaven and the new earth. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. I don't have this down. I would have done this as another verse. and We're supposed to stop at those two verses. But in the Old Testament, it talks about this is the whole duty of man. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God and keep His commandments. That starts from Adam and Eve all the way to the end. People say, you're teaching works-based salvation. No, I'm not. What's the commandment today? Obey the gospel. Get saved. God's way, the proper way. Get saved. Time's running out. And today, now's the time of salvation. Behold, now's the accepted time. Behold, now's the day of salvation. Get saved today. Okay? That's the command we have today. Do you fear God? The man, the, the God that created all things, Jesus Christ that created all things, and can send you to hell to burn eternal torment and flames. For, there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. Do you fear God? I didn't. What it, lead, what it lead to? Keeping His commandment, obeying the gospel. It led to me getting saved and born again. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. The command today is to obey the gospel. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And when He saves you and you belong to Him, you are now in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You belong to God. It's His way. And you start living a life His way. And you start being a light for this world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Brothers says Christ, this is our foundation. Jesus Christ, through His perfect written word, is our foundation. 
This is how we need to fight the, the wickedness of this world. Not through man's wisdom. Not through man's morals. We don't lower the standards down and start talking like the lost world to win the world. You don't act like the world or talk like the lost world to win the world. This is how you win people. So we're going to end this study with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next study.